that best fits for this study is found in Isaiah 46, 9, and 10. The verse was Isaiah 46, 9, and 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So that definition means that prophecy is God declaring his plan. It's not someone predicting the future. It's actually God saying, this is what's going to be. Uh, Revelation 19, 9, 10 says, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do that. Now this was an angel that was speaking to John the Revelator. He said, Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus, the testimony about Jesus, the testimony from Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We went to the verse John 5.39 it says, Search the scriptures, and this is Jesus speaking here, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. I wrote in there that at the time that Jesus said those words, there was no New Testament, it was just an Old Testament. So when he said that, he was basically saying, all of the Old Testament is speaking of me. Everything that's in there is about me. And that's what he was saying. Also, the verse that I gave you here is, um, it also records in, um, that in the volume of the book it is written of him, that's in Psalms 47. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. And, all, and that's also written in Hebrews 10, 7. So, um, after we've got the foundation of what we're talking about in prophecy, and the main thing of this study is that um, the truth of what's going to happen in the future was given to us in the beginning. And that's what the study's all about. So it was God declaring to us the end from the very beginning. And to find where we're going with that, there's seven main aspects of, of God declaring the end from the beginning. And we're going to go through these right now. I, I call these seven keys. If every one of you in here would start, could use these keys as you start studying God's Word, you're going to find it incredibly different than just reading the surface of the Scripture. Because God's given us some things to look into His Word in deeper ways, and it explains things that you'd never see without knowing these keys. So hold on to these keys. You've got a ring, it's got seven keys on it. We're going to go through these right now. The first one is directly spoken or written prophecy. This is one that most of you know about. This is when you find a prophecy in the Bible and it says, one like we talked about this last week, the birth of Jesus, which that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. It was written down hundreds of years before he came. And then when he came, he fulfilled it. So that is directly spoken prophecy and that declares the end from the beginning. The second one is the study of Bible types. I shared a testimony last week of how God changed my life through the understanding of Bible types. Um, basically, it's stories, pictures, symbolisms that's through the Bible, and one would be the ark. The ark is a picture of Christ, and we talked about that last week. Don't have time to go through that again, but we will, we will hit on some Bible types as we go along. The third one is the law of first mention. In order for anyone to understand the fundamentals of Christianity as revealed in the New Testament, it becomes very helpful for him or her to understand the principle that's called the law of first mention. Basically, it's when we see a first appearance of a word or a concept, which is usually in its simplest form, that we can examine the doctrine or the teaching of that, and then as we go through the word of God, it's expounded, it becomes bigger to you. God shows you more and more of it, but that same truth holds all the way through. The law of first mention can be found anywhere in the Bible. Um, it's different than the next one, which is the seed plot of the Bible, and that is that the book of Genesis has properly been called the seed plot, of the Bible, the book of origins. The word Genesis comes from the Greek expression which in its verbal form means to begin or come into existence. The first book of the revelation of God is properly called the book of beginnings. And according to its name and its position in the canon of scripture, we can naturally expect an account of the beginnings of things. An example of this would be in the very first, um, uh, or in the very first part of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in Genesis 3.15, 
there is a prophecy. And if you want to write that down and look this up later, I'll quote it to you here. Genesis 3.15 says this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is the Lord talking to the devil. Okay? And this is after the fall of Adam. We don't have time to go through all these stories, so I'm going to just give you parts of them. It's your job to go back and read the story that leads up to it. Um, Revelation or Genesis, uh, Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's talking to the devil. He tells him, I'm going to put a war between you and the woman. I'm going to put strife between you two. And the woman is, is, um, is going to have a seed. It says, between thy seed, Satan's seed, uh, Jesus mentioned at one point when he was speaking to some people that they are of their father, the devil. I would say that they are the seed of the devil. But in this case, there's a war between them and the seed of the woman. And the woman is the woman that brings a seed. Now, it wasn't typical for, a, uh, in the, for the Hebrews to call the seed coming from the woman. They would say it would be the seed of Adam or the seed of of, of, of Noah or something like that. But in this case, it says the seed of the woman. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the woman is the child Jesus, who was born of a virgin. That's why it was from a woman. Because it wasn't, there was no man connected to the birth of Jesus Christ. And it will bruise thy head. When Jesus died on the cross, he actually crushed the governing power of Satan. He no longer had the power over us that he once had. And thou shalt bruise his heel. An interesting thing about crucifixion, the way that Jesus died for us, is that when someone is dying of crucifixion, it's such a cruel, tormenting type of uh, painful way to die that a person would push just to gasp air. And the way they're nailed to the cross, they would push and their heel would become bruised. So in this very story here, you have the story of the cross. You have the story of the seed that would save us. It's all in a little nutshell. And yet, as the Bible goes on, you see that seed sprouts into a story that we can all understand today. But it's right here in a seed plot of the Bible. Very interesting, isn't it? All right, the fifth one is the biblical law of numerical structure of Scripture. Now, we are going to be looking at a few things with numbers, not as many as we did last week that everybody really loved. Unfortunately, I really feel it's going to be a little bit dry tonight in comparison to last week because we have some really uh, foundational things that need to be talked about. But um, the biblical law of numerical structure of Scripture is actually another one of those phenomena of the Bible in which God declares the end from the beginning. And it can only be stood, understood in the light of divine inspiration. It is the absoluteness of its mathematical structure that makes this a phenomenon. The Bible, from beginning to end, has numbers in it that are used all in, um, in certain ways that you know it's talking about a certain subject, or it's connected to a certain issue. And we went through the, the number 13 last uh, week, and we, we talked about how 13 is a number of rebellion, and where it starts in the seed plot of the Bible, and there was so many connections to it. And we are going to be looking at that in the fourth week in a different way, and it's going to be really exciting. Well, we don't have time to do that today, but I want you to know that this is a very important key. And when you see some of the things I'm going to show you as we go along, you're going to go, wow, that's, that's really cool. How could that have been there unless God put it there? And it's definitely the hand of God. I added two more, or this fifth one is the, the numbers, but I added two since then. Since I was here last week, I added two to this. And the next one is the study of appointed times. Um... Genesis 18, 14 says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Exodus 23, 15 says, Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee, in the time appointed of the month of Ib. For in it thou camest out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And then a really good one is in your paper there, I don't think. It's Dan, Daniel 8, 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed it shall be. So on, on your paper that you have there, uh, the week of human history page that you have, 
there is a chart here, and this is a chart of seven feasts that are, and on this chart they are appointed, excuse me, appointed times given to Israel, and they are and still, they still are today a rehearsal of things to come. And if you look at them, let's just go through them real quick. The first one is Passover. Christ actually died on the day of the Passover when they were sacrificing the sacrificial lambs um, in, in, um, under this feast. In fact, he died at the very time they were taking the lambs and sacrificing them. So Christ actually fulfilled this prophecy. But to the Jews before this who were looking at these feasts, and each year they would uh, proclaim these feasts, they were actually doing a rehearsal of what would happen in the future. The next one is all love of bread. It represents Christ as he laid in the grave. He was there for three days, so his body did not see corruption. Um, and the third one is first fruits, which is the grain harvest. Christ rose on this feast, and it represents the Savior as first of the harvest. And there's a scripture that says, Christ the first fruits and those that are his and his coming. That would be us, and that would be the harvest. So Christ was the first fruits of the harvest. So these, and then the next one, which happened 50 days later, and you're going to see why 50 is very important. The next one is Pentecost, and that was when the Holy Spirit was given to the church, and Christ fulfilled that, and, it, and that was actually Shabbat. Um, so on these feasts, these four feasts have been fulfilled. But if you look at your sheet, the next three have not been fulfilled. The first four were called the spring feasts. The last three are called the fall feasts. Christ fulfilled in his first coming the spring feasts. He is going to fulfill the fall feasts. And I believe that with all my heart. And the, the next one, if you look at it, is called trumpets. Now we all know verses that refer to Christ coming with trumpets, right? Trumpet blast, there's different things that we heard about that. Um, it's called Rosh Hashanah, and it is a picture of the Lord's return to Israel, and at the same time, it also is prophetic of the rapture. Um, and then the next one is the Day of Atonement, which, by the way, this Feast of Trumpets is this Saturday. It is this Saturday. Ten days later, we're going to have a blood moons, and we're going to see a movie about that on Friday. But that very feast is on the Day of Atonement. And so we have some interesting things happening right now. Um, and, but I want to just go through something, and some of you may not agree with me with what I'm going to share with you, but I have to share from my heart. And I have to share what I think God is trying to tell me to share. So, um, by the way, everything I say is not endorsed by these two. <laughs> <laughs> but they love me anyway. <laughs> but uh, we the church in America, we may have gotten some things wrong. And what do I mean by that? I think we fail as, to some extent of studying scriptures with the mindset of the Jews that lived at the time of Christ. They were the audience, not us. They were the audience that Jesus was speaking to. And um, because of that, this failure, we may have missed some very important truths in scripture. Throughout scripture, you saw in these feasts that they were fulfilled by Christ the first time, the first four. There's three yet to come. Those referred to the spring feast and the fall feast. Well, um, I just want to say the next one is trumpets. And my question is, could Jesus come at any moment? We are taught that, right? I don't believe it's so. Uh-oh. I don't believe it's so. I'm going to explain to you something that we in America didn't hear. Things that we should have known if we really got into some deep study. But um, will Jesus return on the Feast of Trumpets? I do believe he will. If Jesus is going to return on the Feast of Trumpets, then it's not Im imminent. It cannot be imminent. And a question, imminent. Imminency means it can happen at any moment. Um, I don't believe Christ could have came before Peter was, was uh, died because Christ even told him how he would die. And he could not have come before that. If he did, he would have been raptured, and then he couldn't have died. So the prophecy would have been at naught, so for naught. So, um, but I do not think that uh, he could come at any moment. I, I don't believe this. In, but what about this verse? Matthew 24, 36 says this. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now I'm going to show you 
how Christ can fulfill this prophetic event on that feast day, on that feast, even when we're not going to know which day or hour. Is that possible? You're going to see in a minute it is. But first, let me give you just a little bit of a background. Biblically, the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, celebrates the Jewish New Year. The word means day of blowing, referring to the horn, the shofar, which was blown a hundred times during this feast. And there was repeated sounds of this trumpet, and then there would be one single final blast, referred to as the last trump. Now, you may have heard that statement before. But that's exactly what they did when they had this feast. Which connects us to this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 51. It's 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. If you were a Jew and you were living during the time that Jesus told the people about his return, and he would, and he'd said, no one knows the day nor the hour. If you were a Jew, you might have thought, huh, is he talking about the Feast of Trumpets? Is he talking about the Feast of Trumpets? Well, the Feast of Trumpets is a celebration or a rehearsal, as I said, and it was unique because it was actually a feast that extended two days. Referring to one, it actually has a name in Aramaic, which I cannot pronounce. I've tried many times. I'm going to try one more time. Yama Aruta. I think I got closer that time than, than I did any other time. But anyway, it means one long day. And it was not like other feasts, which had a specific date or a specific time um, or a day involved. It was traditionally marked by two witnesses. These two witnesses would go into the temple when they would see the sliver of the moon and the, at the beginning of the feast. So they would go to the feast and they would say, they would go to the temple and they would acknowledge, I've seen that sliver of the moon. What makes it impossible to assign a specific day or hour to this event, which the Jewish people were commanded to go over this thing year after year after year, would be that the timing would be different depending on where you live. So they wouldn't be able to everybody start the feast on the same day. And what they would do is when they would spot the sliver of the moon, the two witnesses would report it and then they would start fires on the mountaintops. And when the people a long distance away at other mountaintops would see these fires, they would start fires. And then the people who were even farther out, they would start fires. And it sometimes could take two days for you to even know the day or the hour of this feast. And so that's why it was a day called the longest day. When I first heard that, it made me think of one thing. There's a story in the Old Testament about the day the sun didn't go down. It pretty much stayed there for a long battle. It was a long day. If you check into that story, you'll probably see some Bible types there that are very interesting. Don't have time to go into it. All right, so these were appointed times. Now, most people think that Christ is going to come at any moment. And I truly, honestly believe see no reason why these feasts will not be fulfilled by Christ in the same way he fulfilled the first four. So you can take it or leave it. But this one of the reasons, and the reason why I'm sharing this it's because what I'm sharing here, the stuff that I'm sharing um, in the rest of this study, has to do with the Lord's return in a time that was appointed 2,000 years after he left. And we're going to see that today. But if that was the case, then he couldn't have come. And we've been a little misled by our understanding of that passage. And I can't find one other passage in Scripture that says he's coming at any time. Nothing but this one that refers to the Feast of Trumpets. So, anyway, the fourth or the seventh one is pray for understanding. James 4, 2, and 3. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. 
God expects us to ask, to do so reminds us that we, can, we cannot be apathetic to the world around us. We must engage. This places a responsibility on us as co-workers with God and also as co-workers with each other. And so we can't sit back and watch. We have to ask and seek and knock. This is the most important way to understand Scripture, is by asking. Asking the Lord to reveal something to you. And I'm actually going to give you um, an example. Years ago, I struggled with a passage trying to understand it. And it's an amazing passage. And when I share it with you now, it may seem simple, but it's, it's a key. It's another one of those keys in Bible prophecy. And I prayed about it and prayed about it. And for years, I, you know, I would look at it once in a while, and then I really seriously prayed about it. If the passage is in Revelation 11, 3 through 8, you might want to write this down if you'd like to have this key in Bible prophecy. But uh, I'm going to read it to you. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them into blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, and here's the key, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. Christ was crucified in Jerusalem, and it bothered me for years. Why is it, why are they called, spiritually called Sodom and Egypt? Because they're wicked? That's what I thought. Actually, it's a whole lot more than that. And when the Lord showed it to me, it just opened up so many things. And I already mentioned something that's connected to it. There were two witnesses sent to Sodom. And there was two witnesses sent to Egypt. The two witnesses that were sent to Egypt was Aaron and Moses. We always think of Moses, but there was two. Aaron and Moses. The two witnesses that were sent to Sodom were two angels. And both times... The witnesses were sent before the wrath of God. And that's a key. And we just spoke about the two witnesses that would go during this Feast of Trumpets. And they would go in and talk and say, hey, I witnessed the feast is beginning. There's a connection in all of these stories and all of these things. Hopefully we'll get to some of these before we're done. So would you say that all seven of these that I gave you and they're on your sheet, to keep, um, and if you look through these in your studies, you'll see that all of them are important. But would you say they are all God declaring the end from the beginning? Yeah, praise God. So God rested on the seventh day of creation. And we're going to see as we continue studying this scripture that, that it's, there's a significance of a 7,000 year plan of humanity. Let's see how important to God, though, this rest was to the, God, to the people of God. In Exodus 28, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And, it shall, and you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger within your, within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens... And the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God puts an importance on the way he created the heavens and the earth in seven days. So much so that he wanted to remind the Jews every single week about it. The next is, And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath for the Lord. Six years shall you sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for land. So not only did they re were they reminded of this seven-day thing, work six days, rest on the seventh, 
But then every six years, in the seventh year, the land rested. So there was another Sabbath. Then there is what's called the Jubilee. The Jubilee year is the year at the end of seven cycles of Shemitah. Now they believe that we're in a Shemitah year right now, which is a cycle of sabbatical years, which is this. Seven years times seven. Forty-nine years. And the Jubilee would follow on the 50th, making that last one a double sabbatical um, period of time. And this number 50 is very important. Remember I told you earlier that it was 50 days after um, Christ rose from the dead that the Spirit of God was given to the church. And we're going to look at that a little bit more as we go along. But So in thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, in the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. This, by the way, is um, Leviticus 25, 8 through 15, or 13. This is the one about the Jubilee. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement, which, by the way, is ten days from Saturday. Okay? Now, uh, the movie that we're going to be seeing, The Blood Moons, actually talks about these 49-year periods and then, the, and then the Jubilee, which is added. And what's really strange, I'm just going to give this little bit about the movie that should spark you enough to want to come out and see it. But in 1917, Israel got their land back through a decree called the Balfour Declaration. They didn't all live there, but the land was essentially given to them. In 1917, they believed that was a jubilee year. Fifty years later, and by the way, there was a series of four blood moons at that time. The same thing we're going through right now. Fifty years later, in 1967, they received another piece of their land through the sixth, after the Six-Day War, and it was the city of Jerusalem. At the same time, there was a series of four blood moons. We right now are having a series of four blood moons at the end of next year would be a jubilee, or we're coming into a jubilee year. If that's true, I believe there's another parcel of land they still haven't got. And that's the Temple Mount. And I believe we're all going to see very shortly Israel get a plot of land that's been held from them for a long period of time. Amen. But the prophecies can't be fulfilled until this happens, and it's all happening. So it's a very interesting... Go ahead. Hey, um, I said this on Sunday, but I forgot to mention it's in Jewish years. But yes. 49 years... I was going to get to that, so I got to you. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. And the mic came out. Yeah. I will, well, I'll say it right now. There's actually... The Jewish year is a prophetic year, and the prophetic year is, four, is, um, is 360 days, not... And it's based upon the lunar year, but the, our year is 365 days, so it's not the same. So the two don't match up, so you can't really work it out that way. So if you use lunar years, they come out perfectly. And so there's some discrepancy to some people, but not to those who study it prophet um, prophetically from the way the Bible would teach you to study it. So we're coming up to a time that I think is very, very interesting. And uh, I've got something to share with you. I can't even get to it yet, but uh, I'm just like chomping at the bit because I think we're at the end of the biggest period of Jubilee Jubilees. So, so it's really interesting. I can't wait to get to it. But without setting a little bit more foundation, I can't jump into that. Um, but the number for Jubilee is 50. But the interesting thing, if you continue with this verse I was reading, I'm sorry, but uh, then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all the land, and ye shall hollow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty through all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession. And ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be to you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, and ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. Now if you lost your land, which Israel did, the land would go back to its right. If you lost your father's land, it would go back to you. 
So if you had your father's land given to you, he passed away, and this land was in your hand, but it was his property, and you lost your father's land, it would go back to you after 50 years. Very interesting. What do you think is happening with Israel? The land's coming back to them, as the Jubilees would tell you it would be. So it's very interesting. Does God use one number to represent another number? This is very important in setting the foundation of where we're going. Ezekiel 44. As you... As for you, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it, and you shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assured you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity, 390 days, thus you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Um, this is Ezekiel, a prophet, being told by God, to lay on your side. Now, I don't know if the guy laid there all day long. I don't know. But he did lay there for a period of 390 days. Maybe 10 minutes a day. Maybe he did it every so many hours or something. He couldn't have laid there all the time unless God told him to. But um, the picture is, for every day he laid on his side, it corresponded to a year. And this is where the concept comes from the six days of creation leading towards something bigger, okay? The prophecy of Daniel's 70 weeks. Daniel was actually pondering the meaning of a book he was reading, Jeremiah. He was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah, and he was reading about them being, um, Israel being desolate for 70 years uh, in uh, Babylon. And when he did, an angel came to him, and the angel told him that the 70 years should be taken to mean 70 weeks of years. So instead of one year, it ended up being, uh, or 70 weeks, or 70 years, it ended up being 490 years. And so God uses a number to represent another. Revelation 12, 6 says, The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God that she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. This is Israel fleeing into the wilderness during the tribulation period. But, and I can't go into all these different things. I'm so sorry. Some of this just is really a lot of information. But just try to grab the main thing that I'm trying to say with the numbers here because we're going to see some stuff that's connected to it. Revelation 12, 14 says, but the, two wings, but the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is the same thing, Israel fleeing into the wilderness during the tribulation period. But it says times, or time, times, and a half a time. Those time, times, and a half time represent three and a half years. How do we know that? Because in the other passage it said 1,260 days. Divide that by 360, not by 365, and you have three and a half years. So do you see how God uses one, one thing to represent another? He does it through the word because each are representative building up to something bigger. So God set a standard for Israel built into their commandments to work for six days of the week and then keep the seventh day as a Sabbath day, a day of rest to the Lord. He permanently put the week of creation in remembrance for them. He also deliberately symbolized the week of of creation by giving them instructions for a six-year period of work and a one-year period for the land to rest. And, and so, and that's exactly the promised land that they're in today, and it's in Israel. So, um, stay with me. <laughs> We're building up to something here, all right? One of the psalmists reveal a significant time principle of God from the Song of Moses. This is in Psalms 94. This is one of the most important verses tonight. For a thousand years in your sight are likely yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. That's Psalm 90. God has made a point to include his divinely inspired word that he considered one day the same as a thousand years. One day the same as a thousand years, a millennium. And the Apostle Peter also supported this truth when he spoke about it in 2 Peter 3, 7 and 8. He says, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for, fu for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Why do you say it like that? Because it's important. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Why did Peter, why did Peter tell us not to forget about it? 
because it matters, <laughs> because it's very important. What I believe Peter was implying, and I'm going to paraphrase this, I believe that he was saying that God has a 6,000 year plan for man to work and labor equal to the first six days of creation before he will bring a final judgment on this earth upon the unbelievers. And then comes the seventh day, the day of rest. Now I know you're going to have questions about the 7,000 year thing. We'll get to that. But uh, you're going to see that this is borne out all through Scripture. And I'm going to share with you that the early church believed it too. There's actually books written about it. So, um, and most people don't know this. So it's very interesting. Um, then comes the seventh day, the seventh day of rest. Um, and then comes the seventh millennium, the millennium of rest. It shall come to pass in the day, and this is Isaiah 14.3, I am going to use a lot of scripture. I'm sorry for it. I know that's hard if you don't have this in front of you in the Bible. There are certain verses that we should be looking at in just a minute together. But these are important to, uh, for you to hear. It shall come to pass in the day of the Lord gives you rest from, from your sorrow and from your fear and hard bondage in which you were made to serve. That's in Isaiah. This is in Psalms 95.8. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me. They tried me though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. God warned that there are going to be people that are not going to enter into his rest. And I really hope that that's none of you. I hope everyone in here will someday soon enter into the rest that Christ has from us, for us. But this is the kicker right here, and it's in Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day for all, from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designated a certain day, saying, In David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua has given them rest, then he would have not afterwards had spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Do you see the connection to our rest in the seven days of creation? It's right here in this text. And it's very, very um, firmly established. Those few verses really tie together regarding God's promise of a future rest. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to read this one last verse and get to the passage for tonight that really shows this coming up here. Revelation 21. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a chain, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part of the first resurrection. The Bible is telling us that there's a day coming when we'll have a rest with Jesus and it happens to be a thousand years long. You have a chart right in front of you. If you look at that chart, the top section of this are the, the seven days of Genesis. 
Below that is seven millennial days. And if you look at it, if a day towards a thousand years, that means that 6,000 years would be for man to do his work, but the last 1,000 year period would be the Lord reigning. Of course there will be rest if Satan is bound for a thousand years. Of course there will be rest if Jesus is ruling and reigning. And for us there's going to be rest if we're ruling and reigning with him. And so there is a rest for those who believe in Jesus Christ. So the bottom line is God seems to be operating on a 6,000 year plan and we have biblical reason to believe it. So I need everyone to open the Bible. If you have a Bible, you need to open the Bible for this passage. If you don't, use your, your hand held phone there or whatever you got in and your computer or whatever you have. Yeah, if, if you have a few Bibles to hand up. Here's some right here. Anybody need a Bible? I do have a theory, yeah. but I don't have the Bible. That's a good question, um, and I don't mind sharing it real quick. The Bible says, unless those days were shortened, there would be no flesh saved. There happens to be something in, in the time period that may be some kind of a shortening. And if God gave us a 6,000-year plan, and there's 6,000 years, it's sort of like he said, you know what? You followed Satan, you fell, and I'm going to give you... The, uh, saint and dominion for it for the six days that were meant for you but I'm going to cut it short a little bit because if I didn't all flesh would be lost and so he kind of is saying I'm going to still be true to my plan and for that little season at the end I'm going to let Satan out again to do his dirty deed one more time there's a reason for it at the end of the thousand years and I'm not going to go there because it's pretty deep to get into that but the fact is it could be that God is just fulfilling a period of time that just didn't quite get filled. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Or do you think he's going to check a thousand again to see if it's still going to be the soil? I'm sorry, I can't really hear you. Do you think he maybe is going to check people out to see if they are still going to be the soil? Well, actually, at the, at, yes, I do believe that there is a trial going on there because there's actually seven of these trials throughout history and every one of the man fails. Um, so, and there's always a judgment at the end of each one. So, but that's a whole different study and I don't have time for it right now. Okay, but anyway, that's a very good question and um, I do think it's a test and I do think, not only that, but um, um, it's just one more reason for God to judge at the very end. And so, but please open your Bible to Hosea Chapter, chapter, I hope I answered your question good enough. And, all right. Open your Bible to Hosea 5.15. Hosea is in the Old Testament. Daniel, Hosea, I think. Yes. Now, Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. Do you remember on the seven different keys that I gave? The first one is the study of, or um, the, that is um, directly spoken or written prophecy. This is number one on those seven keys. All right? So but before I read it, let me give you a little insight. Um, in the context of this chapter, the whole chapter before it, the context is the Lord's face is withdrawn from Israel. And so up to this point in this chapter, as in many cases in prophecy, God is talking directly to the people of that day. But then all of a sudden, when you get in verse 515, he's not only speaking to them, but he's speaking to a future group of people. And so um, that's what we're going to find out. It becomes more than just about him withdrawing his face there. It actually is now becoming, I've got hope for you. There's something in the future for me. I'm not going to be turned away from you forever. So he isn't just talking about um, his face being withdrawn, but he, in the middle of this, uh, his talk to Ephraim here, and this happens to be about the son of, of uh, Joseph, um, the, tri uh, the tribe of jo uh, Joseph, or the, I'm sorry, the house of Ephraim, which is the seed of Joseph that he's speaking to here. 
So let's get right to the passage. It's, um, it's verse 15. It says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. We are, and we're, what we're going to see here is that this is the Lord speaking. Let's read it again. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. This is what it says in my school field Bible. It says a remnant in the last days. So whoever put the Schofield Bible together realized that this is a prophecy of the last days. But they don't go into any detail at the bottom. I haven't seen much written on it. In fact, that this commentary that you're hearing today is, um, is not something I've ever read. I've never heard a commentary like this. But it's pretty clear from the scriptures that this is what it's talking about. <clears throat> um, and I, by the way, I do believe that what, what I'm sharing with you is the Lord desiring you to see these truths. I really do. And I hope everyone in here is blessed. I tr I've been praying that all week. I've been praying it off and on since we started. I'm just praying that everyone will be blessed and that you will know that you know that the Lord is coming back soon. The first part is, I will go and return to my place. Who's talking here? I believe it's the Lord. Je Jesus said in John 3.13, no man hath ascended into heaven, except he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Christ was here on earth. He's saying, I have the ability to ascend into heaven. No one else has had the ability. There is the ability of an angel coming and snatching you away, or Elijah going up in a chariot of fire. But no one has the ability to ascend into heaven. Um, and so he says this which he says, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So his place is at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. That's where he was. And he came to earth. And he died for us. He came on a mission to save us. And then after he rose again, he went back to the right hand of the Father. And so I think that this is the Lord speaking, saying, I'm going to go back to my place. I will go and return to my place. To the next, the next, well, let me read this verse to you. Deuteronomy 30, 12 says this. And it is not heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us into heaven and bring it down unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Proverbs 34 says this. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Or who has bound the waters in, as, in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? This is talking about Jesus, who can ascend into heaven. So that verse right there connects that to that right there. But the best verse about this is one that Cheryl used last Sunday in church. And thank you, because I didn't think of using this passage until I heard you say it. Um, but uh, John 14, 2, 4 says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. How would Jesus know unless he came down from heaven? Right? So he knew. And then he says, For I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, he is going to go. He went to the right hand of the Father and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. What a beautiful promise. He came from the Father's right hand. He came to earth. He rose back up. He went to the Father's right hand. And he's up there today preparing a place for us who believe in him. Let's read on. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Who is the they? And what is the offense? What's that? It's a little more than that, but it has got to do with sin. Remember the context of, of this chapter in Hosea is against the house of Ephraim. That's the context of the passage. 1 Peter 2, 6 and 8 says... Starting in, in verse 6, for this, it, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious stone, a cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. That's Christ. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this is referring to the Jewish leaders. They rejected the cornerstone which is Jesus Christ. 
the very cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Now this is referring to a people that lived a long time ago. But at the same time, it refers to a nation that still re rejects Jesus today. That doesn't mean Jews aren't getting saved all around us. And it doesn't mean they're not on the same plateau that we are. So please don't take this offensively if you are a Jew. <laughs> okay. So anyway, Jesus referred to this truth again in the parable of the wicked tenants. Matthew 21, 42 and 44. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. Christ became the head, so to speak. He became the most important one, even though he was rejected. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing fruit of it. So it was given to the Gentile nations. And we're going to see in our graph how that works into all of this uh, eventually. And he who falls on the stone will be broken in pieces, but... Uh, on whoever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. So again, I find it very interesting that this is uh, speaking this context to Ephraim, but the, at the same time, and again, Ephraim is the seed of Joseph. And in the story of Joseph, Joseph was rejected by his brothers. It's probably the best biblical type, which is number three, I think it is, uh, types two. The study of Bible types and the seven keys that I gave you. Um, the, it's a Bible type because he was rejected by his brethren, his brothers, and they wanted to kill him. They didn't actually kill him, but in the mind of his father, he was dead because they took his coat of many colors and dipped it in blood and, and gave it to his father. And so, in the mind, he was he was as if he was dead. And later on, Joseph was sold into slavery, but years later. He is, he is risen to the right-hand man of Pharaoh, having all the authority, as if he is the God over Egypt. So he's a picture of the Messiah being rejected and raised to glory. Um, but in this picture here, what we're talking about is the rejection here. So they did reject him. And later on, it says in this passage, till they acknowledge their offense. Their offense was rejecting Christ. Well, it just so happens that it wasn't later on until Joseph, uh, Joseph's brothers, during a very bad time of trouble, which were sent to go into Egypt for food. And when they went there, because of the trouble that was happening, it brought them to a point where they said this. In Genesis 42, 21, they said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. They acknowledged their offense. And Israel is soon going to acknowledge its offense of rejecting the Messiah. Let's read on. In their affliction they will seek me early. It's called in the Bible the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 37 says this, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And we also know it as the tribulation period. Jesus also referred to this time in Matthew 24, 21. For then there shall be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So it's during the time of the tribulation period, which is just about to happen very soon, that Israel will seek its Messiah and they will confess their guilt. They will acknowledge their offense. And then it says, in their affliction, in, the, in this period of time, they will seek the Messiah early. So just read on now. You got your Bibles ahead of you? This next part is the most important part. Chapter 6, verse 1. Come. Now it's Israel speaking. The first part of this was Jesus speaking. And now Israel is speaking. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten. And he will bind us up. The Lord is going to revive Israel. They were scattered amongst the nations as God said they would be. And he is going to heal them and he's going to bind them up. And this next verse is the bottom line. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, 
he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. Nobody is going to live in the sight of the, of the Messiah until the Millennial Kingdom, which is how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. If the third day is a thousand years long, how long are the other two? It would be 2,000 years, wouldn't it? It says it right here in the Scripture. It's referring to the very same truth that we've been talking about. That God is using a 2,000 year period from when? It tells you in the Scripture, this very passage, when the 2,000 years began. It is from the time of Christ, but it's specific here. Let's go back to the very first part of this verse, uh, of chapter 5, or the 15th verse. Of See if anybody can find it. What's that? I can't hear. Yes, it says, it says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal. He hath uh, scattered, he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and in the third day we're going to live in the Messiah's sight. Pretty clear, isn't it? How can it be missed by the church? It's been missed for thousands of years, but the early church did not miss this truth. This was a foundation that you had to get, and in order to get it, we had to go through all these verses and get you to understand that God has a period of rest. It's coming up. He's working with Israel. There's a time period of 2,000 years from his ascension. From his ascension. Now, if you have questions about this, think about those questions. And when you come back next week, I'll try to answer those. Does anybody have any questions from anything I said tonight? So have you got the date? What's that? Have you got the date? <laughs> I have some thought. Yeah. <laughs> I'll share some really cool stuff so that you can't miss it. I mean, I'm not going to give you a day or an hour. I'm going to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you when the Lord's going to return. I, I don't think that's for anybody to do. But I can tell you, we're supposed to be watching. And he's given us enough here to be able to say it's coming soon. It's close, isn't it? What's that? It's close. It's very close. Yeah. It's very close. And, and I do believe that we're very near the end of the 6,000 year period. And I'm going to show you this numerically in Scripture over and over and over again. These guys know about it, but I'm telling you, it's awesome. It's awesome. Will you pray with me? All right. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and for your truth of your word. I pray your spirit will speak to every heart in here, Lord, and help us to understand these passages. May us not uh, apply them poorly, Lord, and may we be clear of mind when it comes to these things. Help us to know you, Jesus. Help us to know your soon return. Help us to be prepared and be ready and be watching. Thank you, Lord, that you are coming, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, to reign on this earth. So we love you, Lord, and we just pray that you'll bless us and bring us back next week to be able to further the study and to have more clarity of mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you go, check Sure. Hey, uh, before you go, I got a question for David. Oh, I got a question. I had a question. Um, in regards to no man knows the day or the hour, is would you say that um, the day or the hour is in a reference to, well, we kind of might know the day, meaning the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, yes. the Feast of Trumpets? Yes, I truly believe the Lord's coming back on the Feast of Trumpets. I truly believe. I have no reason not to because he fulfilled the first four of those feasts. Amen. And he's going to fulfill the next three. So what is this? That is a few days from now. It's this year. I don't believe it's this one. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to hold you on that. But this was but I'll be waiting and watching anyway. Yes, they come every day. I know that some of these things are new to you. I'm not trying to, I don't want anybody misled or feeling uh, like maybe you've been misled. But the thing is, we have not as a church studied these things with the mind of the Jew. We have not we got our own things that we thought they were and held dearly to them. And it's really hard to let go of them. 
I had things that I believed for 25 years as I studied deep scripture because I listened to everybody else. And I just listened to everything that these people were saying. And, and then I started studying for myself. And I wasn't the only one seeing these same truths. And today you'll see many, many people who are starting to see these same truths. And when I complete this, I know that you'll know that you know. I have no doubt in my mind that you will be totally convinced God is working with a 6,000 year period and we're almost at the end of it. Okay, one more. Actually, a 7,000 year because there is a millennial to follow. And on Rosh Hashanah, it's uh, September 13th, right? 13th, and 10 days later is the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Which is the blood moon uh, night that we're going to be looking at. But these series of blood moons have some meaning to the land of Egypt, or the land of Egypt. It's spiritually called Egypt, by, by the way, but the um, uh, land of Israel. And so there is something going on there. I truly believe that there is a connection. And I think just for us to understand, no man knows the day or the hour, the breakthrough for me on understanding that was understanding that on the, it's the only feast, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, it September 13th, that starts on the first day of the month. So they couldn't know what that first day of the month was until the two witnesses went out so and said, witnesses. hey, yep. this is it. Oh, boom, we're right here. No man idea. knows the day or the hour. That's why we're told to watch. Because they were watching in the same way. They were watching for something. They'd have some kind of idea because they would be watching the lunar phases. But they didn't know. And right. sometimes clouds would even obscure the, the crescent of the moon and they couldn't even see it. So there may be a, a delay. And so there's some interesting things that we don't know. Um, but it all is connected to the Feast of Trumpets. How coming into a new moon right now? Yes, and the 13th. Or Saturday. Or Saturday on the Sabbath. <laughs> I didn't want that to be specific. <laughs> so, any, any other questions? I love questions. I really do. Because it makes me think better when I have questions thrown at me. Any, any other questions? Please. If they sound silly to you, please raise your hand. And if it's something that you think I may not agree with, I still want to hear it. <laughs> Yes. On the seventh day, they rested. Yes. And it seems like they would understand at this point in time that there's got to be some some issue with Jesus related to that. And you would think they would get that inkling that there's something there just based on that six-day war. You think they would have said in all their papers and all their magazines, six-day war and the seventh day we rested, <laughs> praise God. Yeah, yeah, but they're just not there, are they? So. <laughs> Many, many miracles. Yeah. Are some, aren't some of those there in the movie, right? Oh, yes. many are You're going to find some really interesting things about the Six Day War in the movie that we're going to see Friday night. You were going through that last section where you were jotting down all the scriptures you were reading. Yes. I noticed there's a lot of 42, 24. Scripture references? I don't put any stock. I don't put any stock in scripture references because there were no scripture references when it was written. But. I think God still is in control of those. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to say anything about that. That to me, that, but there's some phenomenal things. We're going to be looking at the number 120 uh, systems, uh, lives of people, uh, length of people's lives, how they all fit together, how they all said the same thing, how they all point to the same thing. In, in fact, you can't read the Bible after knowing these keys and not see that all of it fits together. It's a big puzzle that's fitting together like this. And it's becoming clearer to the church. And it's becoming clearer to me. I mean, as I, as I was preparing for this, I have forgotten more than I remembered. I'm telling you the truth. I would lay in bed at night and this stuff would start coming to me and I couldn't even sleep. Ask my wife. I'd be like, wow, and I, oh, and I remember getting up a few times and going, oh, i got to remember that. But there, as I couldn't sleep. And it's because I started thinking more on it to prepare for you. And I'm glad that the Lord made me forget most of it because it would have been way too much to handle. But we're going to handle some very important stuff that's going to make it clear to you. And i got to tell you, the Lord is sharing all sorts of stuff with me. I know this is happening with some other people that I know that see these things. And, and I do know it's happening with the church in general that more and more people are seeing the signs and, and, the, and the fact that everything is fitting together like a big puzzle. Yes, well, that's important. 
and they're going to have uh, an awakening very shortly. And they're going to, they're going to, in their affliction, seek him early. You see how those passages that we read, how they all fit together in the things that we know are going to happen? So, yes, the two days is almost up, everybody. And that's kind of interesting when you think about it. Like, you're, I'm probably sure that many of you are thinking, well, yeah, well, when did that start and how long is it really? Remember, it's prophetic years, not our years. So they're actually shorter. There's a lot of things to think about that isn't on the surface, and unless you know how the Bible works, you're going to miss it. So, yeah. Right? Can you give us a wrap-up prayer as far as repentance? Because okay. hey, we're not guaranteed right. that if some, some of the you made Yes. Um, Father, as we study tonight, Lord, we come across some verses that say that some will not enter into your rest. Okay. And Father, that is not our any of our uh, desire here tonight to see anyone that doesn't enter into that rest. And Lord... The word has gone out, Lord, that you're coming back, that there's some troublesome times upon the world coming, and we already know this. We see this all around us. And so today, Lord, we pray, Lord, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, that they would open their heart to you tonight. Yes. That they would not leave this building without asking Jesus to be their Savior so they can come into this rest. And Lord, we pray, God, for um, eyes to be uh, able to see and, and hearts that are, are not hardened but are soft and soften so that we can receive from you and every one of us lord i just pray lord that you would prepare us the bible says for us to watch and to be ready and i pray for everyone in here lord that we would all be watching for the return of the lord and that we would be 100 percent completely laid out before you ready and humbled ourselves before you jesus we humble ourselves before you tonight and ask you to anoint us with oil the spirit of uh, the holy spirit of god and help us to see truth Help us to, re to have it revealed to us in such a way that we know it's from you. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.